Hello, Method Arts Center Poetry Gathering friends. This is Vince. This is Naomi. And she's hogging the couch, but it's okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> Welcome to our home and to another celebration of poetry and words of impact. This video will be posted on the Medford Arts Center webpage and also our YouTube channel. Simply search for Medford Arts Poetry. Tonight we'll be concluding our celebration of the words and the women of the suffragette movement. We'll be sharing a very special connection between a woman of that era and the Medford Arts Center. We'll be talking a little bit about our moms and we'll also be sharing words of impact spoken by a woman born just a few miles away. Well, let's first begin with the words of an artist born on July 3rd, 1860 in Hartford, Connecticut, novelist, short story writer, and poet. She was also a lecturer for social reform. And in 1911, Charlotte Perkins Gilman published a book entitled The Man-Made World where she spoke about the concept of angiocentrism and the impact on our culture. Gilman argued that women's contributions to civilization throughout history have been halted because of this androcentric culture. She believed that womankind was the underdeveloped half of humanity and improvement was necessary to prevent the deterioration of the human race. Charlotte Perkins Gilman was also a poet, and she wrote, We as Women. There's a cry in the air about us, we hear it before, behind, of the way in which we as women are going to lift mankind. With our white frocks starched and ruffled, and our soft hair brushed and curled, hats off, for we as women are coming to save the world. Fair sisters, listen one moment, and perhaps you'll pause for 10. The business of women as women is only with men as men. What we do, we as women, we have done all through our life. The work that ours is ours as women is the work of mother and wife. But to elevate public opinion and to lift up erring man is the work of the human being. Let us do it if we can. But wait, warm-hearted sisters, not quite so fast so far. Tell me, how are we going to lift the thing any higher than we are? We're going to purify politics and to elevate the press. We enter the foul paths of the world to sweeten and cleanse and bless. To hear the high things we are going to do and the horrors of man we tell, one would think we as women were angels and our brothers were fiends of hell. We that were born of one mother and reared in the self same place, in the school and the church together, we of one blood, one race. Now then, all forward together. But remember, every one, that tis not by feminine innocence the work of the world is done. The world needs strength and courage and wisdom to help and feed. When we as women bring these to man, we shall lift the world indeed. Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And now Naomi is going to introduce us to a very special lady. Around 1890, people would flock to public lectures and recitals as people today go to concerts and, and movies and theaters. I'm going to introduce you to a writer and a speaker who gained much of her notoriety by being an influential speaker in these venues about the virtues of a government without restrictions. She spoke about equality and freedom for everyone. Voltaire de Clare today would be considered a rock star in terms of her popularity among anarchists, freedom fighters, liberty fighters. She was in essence a rock star anarchist. And while she lectured, she wrote speeches, books, poems, articles for Mother Earth, among other uh, newspapers. She was also a teacher, a poet, a lecturer. She devoted her life to revolting against systems, institutions, governments, and ideologies which held power or dominated the free spirit. And in this way, her words and her passion helped to fuel the suffragette and the feminist movements. 
she saw male domination as a form of tyranny and exploitation. In 1890, she said, let every woman ask herself, why am I the slave of man? Why is my brain said not to be equal of his brain? Why is my work not paid equally with his? Why must my body be controlled by my husband? Why may he take my children from me, will them away, yet while unborn? Let every woman ask. She wrote that she was interested in the special work of arousing in women the desire and will to be industrial independent, disgusted by institutions which subordinated women. Voltrine was a fan of feminist Mary Wollstonecraft, which was a, who was a pioneer in the women's equality movement. And in 1903, Voltrine said, if we must have hero worship, let us have a little shero worship to even things up a wee bit. And now bringing this a little closer to home, our very own Medford Arts Center has a connection to this rock star, Voltrine Declare. You see, Voltrine is the great great grandmother of Eric Moore, who is married to Alicia Moore, who is the executive director at Medford Arts Center. So we are all connected somehow to Voltrine, and now you are as well. I'd like to add that if you'd like to learn about this vital and passionate woman, the two wonderful resources that I have with me for you to look at. This is called Exquisite Rebel by Sharon Presley, edited by Sharon Presley and Crispin Sartwell. And the other great resource is An American Anarchist, The Life of Altering Declare by Paul Average. And I will list these in the description so that if you care to research a little bit yourself, you'll have that information. For a time, Voltrine Declare lived in Philadelphia, and in February of 1890, she wrote these words. How many drops must gather to the skies before the cloudburst comes? We may not know. How hot the fires and under hells must glow, ere the volcano's scalding lavas rise. Can none say but all what the hour is sure? Who dreams of vengeance has but to endure? He may not say how many blows must fall, how many lives be broken on the wheel, how many corpses stiffen neath the pall, how many martyrs fix the blood-red seal. But certain is the harvest time of hate, and when weak moans by an indignant world re-echoed to a throne or backward hurled, who listens, hears the mutterings of fate. Voltaire Declare. And now for a special conversation about two very special women in our lives. Our mothers. Mom. Moms. For most of my life, I have looked to the past in order to understand a present situation. And as we've been exploring the suffragettes and the female leaders in the movement, I find myself bringing this all closer to home. We all stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, and I have found myself thinking about my mom as we've been going through the series. Here she was, imagine, she was born in New York City in 1924. That's just four years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So she was seeing a world fraught with change as she was growing up. Santa Josephine was her name, and she was born into a family of, an Ital of Italian Catholic immigrants who worked very hard and lived modestly in New York City. 1924, if we think back, the Spanish pandemic of 1918 had come and gone. World War I had just ended. The Ku Klux Klan and the prohibition were beginning to align. By the time my mom was of voting age, many of her cousins and friends had been drafted and the Great Depression was about to begin. Because of her status and culture, she did not have the opportunity to finish college. Her greatest desire, and I heard this throughout my life, was that she wanted to attend law school at St. John's. Instead, she married and raised four children while working at law firms and corporations throughout her life. She retired when she was well into her 70s. Circumstances guided her decisions, and the changes which she saw in her lifetime happened too slowly for her taste. 
She often lamented to me and to us all of the, often to all of us children, it's still a man's world. She expected her children and especially her two daughters to go to college because to her a college degree for a woman meant achieving a level of success that she had not. When my sister and I did receive our degrees, our diplomas, she reminded us often, you are free, white, and 21, and you have no excuses. It took me years to understand this comment in context. She was really referring to her own history. She had seen the injustices of society where race, gender, and class had an impact on your ability or her ability to make choices. And her reference to 21 was directly related to the fact that as a young woman, she was able to cast her vote, feel heard, earn an income, and start to build a foundation for her future and for her family. And being able to vote meant we had the right, but also the responsibility to do better for the next generation, to work harder, and not to, make, not to take any of those choices for granted. Every year, as long as I can remember, my mom would proudly stand at the voting booth at the local school to greet voters. She took that role on with pride. That image to me means so much more now as we've explored the suffragettes and the sacrifices they had made for this in that movement to arrive. That is just a snippet of a woman of that generation. My mom, who would have been 97 years old next March. Amazing how Naomi's mom's story is very similar to my mother's story. Elaine Margaret Rocco was born in Manhattan. She grew up in the very northern tip of the island in Washington Heights. She walked across the street to Mother Cabrini High School. She earned a scholarship to go to college, but she wouldn't attend. That's not what women did back then. Years later, of course, she raised a family in Bergen County, New Jersey where Naomi ended up living as well. And she manned the polls for years and years as well. When she raised us, she taught us about that responsibility to vote and how women had obstacles that they had to overcome. She encouraged us to try our best, and we did. Our mothers met only once in 2012 at a special dinner we had. And what I remember most about our moms that day was how much they laughed because their babies were finally gonna be happy. Thanks to moms. Now, our mothers were phenomenal women. We'd like to share with you the special words of an inspiring poet, Maya Angelou's phenomenal woman. Thank you. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size, but when I start to tell them they think I'm telling lies, I say it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please and to a man, the fellows, stand, the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. Then they swarm around me, a honey, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I tried to show them, they say they still can't see. I say, it's in the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud, I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need of my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me. Now, to complete our celebration 
of the women in the words of the suffragette movement, we turn to Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and Paulsdale, the birthplace of Alice Paul. Back in 1917, when Alice Paul began the Silent Sentinels march in front of the White House, she was widely criticized. Her timing was wrong. She was being insensitive. The president would be upset. Well, this is how Alice Paul responded to that criticism. The world crisis came about without women having anything to do with it. If the women of the world had not been excluded from world affairs, things today might have been different. She was also widely criticized because women at that time were not allowed to be involved in politics. They weren't allowed to speak up. Well, this is how Alice Paul responded to that. Unless women are prepared to fight politically, they must be content to be ignored politically. And in February of 1974, Robert S. Gallagher interviewed Alice Paul, and this is what she said about reform and equality. I have never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality, which is a nice thing about our campaign. It really is true, at least to my mind, that only good will come to everybody with equality. If we get to the point where everyone has equality of opportunity, and I don't expect to see it, we have such a long, long way ahead of us, that it seems to me it is not our problem how women use their equality or how men use their equality. The words of Alice Paul. The suffragette movement was launched in Seneca Falls in 1848. It took 72 years for that one day to come. And it was a Wednesday, August 18th, 1920, in Knoxville, Tennessee, when the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature had to cast a tie-breaking vote. Nobody knew that day that the Honorable Henry, I'm sorry, Harry Thomas Byrne had a note in his pocket from his mother urging him to vote aye. And he did. And like many of the most historical events in the history of America, a poet captured that moment. Days later, in the Knoxville Sentinel, this limerick was published. There is a young man from Nyota who for precedent cares no iota. He sprung a surprise when he flopped to the eyes and enraptured the feminine voter. Thank you all for joining us on this wonderful journey exploring our nation's history. We've had a lot of fun doing it. We hope you've enjoyed it. Till we see you again, this is Vince. This is Naomi. Wishing you well. Thank you. Stay safe. Good night.